Thessalonians chapter 3. We went uh, through verse number 6 last week, or, or uh, yeah, verse number seven, uh, 5 last week, and then we're picking up in verse 6 today, and just covering a few verses. And what I found is the automatic default place where you go to 1 Thessalonians is usually chapter 4. Right? We see chapter 4 because we know the great doctrine of the rapture is there, but chapters 1, 2, and 3 are just so personal of, of the Apostle Paul and, and Timothy and, and Silas about the, their love that they had for these believers who had, like all believers, past, present, future, they had their shortcomings, and so Paul had a great concern for them through it all. He was concerned that he couldn't be with them, so last we knew, he had sent Timothy. And so I like the report here of, of, of Timothy when he came back to Paul. And so we're going to pick it up and let, let's, let's do ourselves a favor once again. And, and uh, let's, let's read the, the, the whole chapter this morning. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 3. Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone, and sent uh, Timotheus, our brother and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith, that no man should be moved by these afflictions, for yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. For verily, when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation, even as it came to pass, and ye know. For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you, and I will labor be in vain. But now, when Timothy, uh, Timotheus came from you unto us, and brought us good tidings of your faith and charity, and that ye have good remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us, as we also to see you. Therefore, brethren, we are comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith. For now we live if ye stand fast in the Lord. For what thanks can we render to God again for you? For all the joy wherewith we joy for your sakes before our God, night and day praying exceedingly, that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. Now God himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way unto you, and the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. To the end he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. And Lord, we just pray that you would bless, uh, bless your, your scriptures today, bless our time that we have together in your word as well. And we do pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Verse number six. He starts with that wonderful three-letter eraser called but. But now. So we... For this cause, when he could no longer forbear. Remember, Paul Paul had this, this, this stress on him. Remember, forbearance is, is like a roof and, and with, a, with a load on top of it. Paul came to a breaking point where he couldn't he handle, he had to know what was going on with the Thessalonian believers there. You know, and I, I had likened that to... Uh, to a mother waiting past the 11 o'clock curfew, wondering where their children are. I hope they're all right. Now, all this and that, and before cell phones, it was much more heroin than it is now. But, verse number 7 says, But now, when Timotheus came from you unto us, and brought us good tidings of your faith and charity, and that ye have good remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us, as we also to see you. The, the, he, he heard about their faith and charity together. Last week, we covered a lot about charity, being love out of, out of 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. 
If there is faith, hope, and charity, the greatest of these is charity. Charity or love is the greatest motivation for Christians together to love one another. Our ministry is founded upon love, but not just any old love. We have people that love their college so much, they bequest billions of dollars to the, to the alma mater, they, to the alumni fund. Is that the love that God is talking about? It's love that is directed toward God by God. Remember in, in 1 John chapter 4, God defined, uh, the word defines God. God is love. That's what we have to realize. But we always ask the question, we were talking about this the other day, said there are people there that say, how? If God is a God of love, how has he, how has he allowed some things to go on in this world? Why do we still have wars? Why do we still have sickness and disease, famine, all these different things? Because God is also a God that loves us so much that humanity can choose the way they're going to go. Amen? Amen. We can choose whether we're going to trust God or not. And sadly to say that choice even goes all the way to the one who has been sanctified by God himself. You know, Christians make bad decisions all the time. Amen? I get the mirror. The mirror wrote, you can choose not to do certain things that, that would be an offense unto God. We have the choice. But look at what it says. It says, uh, He says, when Timothy is came from you unto us and brought us good tidings of your faith and charity. They had both. They, they both go along like on, on a rail. Faith and charity go together. There are a lot of people who have faith. Matter of fact, the Bible says that all men is given a measure of faith. You know, that each of us exhibited faith when we sat down in these, in these pews that have been sitting here for I don't know how many years, we didn't check to see if the wood, wood was still good. We just automatically sat down. That's an exercise of faith. But our faith is in the faith of Christ. Right? He was faithful to, to go to the cross. He was faithful to do his Father's will. So faith and charity, though, they go together. Here's a question. What comes first, faith or charity? Yes. I heard that back there. Yes. They both go together. Because if you don't have faith in the right object, you're going to have the wrong charity and vice versa. If you have the, if you have the, the love which belongs to God, you're going to have the wrong, wrong faith. Right? People are going to have faith in what they, what they, they can do. They're going to have faith in, some people even have faith in faith. They don't treat, they don't treat faith as, as something that's active, as, as part of life. They treat faith as a force. Why do they do that? Because they treat the Holy Spirit as a force as well. I, uh, my son Bobby uh, texted me, I don't know, he was, I guess he was snooping around at a, at a house he was working at, but he noticed they had, they had Christadelphian literature up. They, they had books and everything about Christadelphianism. And I know you're all saying, you never heard of Christadelphians. <laughs> they have a church right in Greenwood Street here. But Christadelphians are a sect that believes the Holy Spirit is a force. They believe Jesus wasn't God. He, he, only, he was an, only an actor playing the role of God while he was on this earth. And they also believe that faith is a force. This isn't just, to, this is the same kind of doctrine that the Jehovah's Witnesses have at the same time. They have those same beliefs about the Holy Spirit and about Jesus. Jesus wasn't God. Neither was the Holy Spirit. He's just a force. Now, if you believe the Holy Spirit is just a force, that's a farce. 
See if I can say that again. I think I'm worn out. <laughs> the Holy Spirit isn't a force. The Holy Spirit is a member of the Trinity. He, he, the Holy Spirit, is God. Otherwise, Jesus wouldn't say, He, the Comforter, He will come. And He'll convict you of all sin. You know, there, there are places where the Bible in Romans chapter 5, it says, it, when it comes. Active, when the Spirit comes, He'll, 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 He lost my words, sorry. It's easy to do nowadays. But the, the motivation for faith is the love, and that love is the love of God, or the love from God, and the motivation for love is faith. The right faith in the right God equals the right faith and love. Amen? So he, he was checking, he was sending, he had sent Timothy and Timothy brought good tidings of your faith and charity. They were growing together in those things. Running together as one. You'll find that I, I don't have the scripture references right now, but if you read in the Bible, you'll see that those two go together. Faith and charity. Mm -hmm. they, they go together. They're on the same track. Says, uh, but now when Timotheus came from you unto us and brought us good tidings, your faith and charity, and that you have good remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us, as we also to see you. Remembrance. That's the number one thing we need to do. Remember. Remember, when I was with you, I told you these things. Paul would say, remember. The greatest thing for us to remember is where we were and where we are. Amen? That's true in geography as well. Do you remember when you were at a certain time and date? Do you remember where you were on 9-11? I remember that. I remember that uh, very very uh, clearly. I almost remember where I was in the day of day of my of JFK's assassination, but I was only three, so I don't remember details, but I can, I can still remember being a young toddler. I can still remember my mother crying and weeping about the news. It was such a tragedy. Remember, the greatest thing that we can remember is to remember that we were, were dead in sins and trespasses, right? Remember that. That's a good thing to remember. But don't dwell there. Because the best thing to remember is this. Jesus died, was buried, and rose again. Remember that. Sadly, and I know I've been on this for several weeks, sadly, most of Christendom has just forgotten totally about the gospel. They've forgotten who they are in Christ. And I'll look into all different, uh, different things in order to, to have sanctification. But we need, we need to always look at what Jesus Christ did. Not only at the cross, but remember that he rose again. Because if, if, if Jesus did not rise, what does the Bible say? We're all dead in our sins. We're still there. We have a God. Remember, he rose again. Well, first, remember he died. Remember he rose again, and we died his death, and we, we were resurrected in his resurrection as well, where, where the old man is indeed dead. So we have a new man. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, whoever is in Jesus Christ is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Yes, we still remember them. But behold, all things are new. I don't like the term have become new in that case, but are become new. Right now, though we're sitting here decaying and faltering, we're new creatures in Jesus Christ. That's something to remember. Uh, I'm trying to think. I, I think I saw a TV commercial about something to remember. You know, I forget what the TV commercial is about, so obviously it didn't work, did it? But when we remember what Jesus Christ did, 
And that's, that's where we get our motivation to both love and charity. To, no, no, it's the same thing. To both, for both faith and love, our motivation is that Jesus Christ died, went buried, and, wrote, and rose again from the grave. I want, to, I want to go back for a second and touch on the love of God for a second. Let's go to 1 John chapter 2. I know I'd already mentioned 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 2. This is such a great deal. I get to travel miles for it. For a bunch of metal that's going to tarnish and, and all that different things. For all that, all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world, what? Passeth away, and the lust thereof, but but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. How do you do the will of God? How do you do the will of God? I believe. Right? Even the apostles asked Jesus, what work shall we do to have eternal life? And he said, simply believe on the one whom was sent. John 6, 29. And the world passes the way and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Little children, it is the last time, as ye have heard, that Antichrist shall come. Even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. I went one verse over where, where I was going to go because this opens a whole other can of worms right here. 
But I'm going to stop right there with the, with the lust, with the love of the world. All those things will fade away. The new car will fade away. The new Maserati that, that I saw, wow, I'd love to have that car. And the little sign says, boy, if you have $500,000, you can have the car. <laughs> Sorry, I don't have that. So, But those are things that pass away. The Maserati will be a used Maserati pretty soon. It'll be on the junk heap just as much as my 2006 Focus will be on the junk heap someday. No matter what, an expensive junk or an inexpensive junk, that's what you have. But the, the love of the world is what motivates most people. And sadly, it's, it's permeated into the church as well today rather than the love of God, the love that comes from Him, and our reciprocal love that we give to the Lord. Let's go back to 1 Thessalonians. So Timothy came with a report of their, their faith and charity and that they remember us. Remember Paul, Timothy, and Silas. They remembered them uh, desiring greatly to see us as we also to see you. Verse number seven. Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress of your faith or by your faith, rather. Hearing that report from Timothy that he brought back brought joy to Paul, even in his own trials. Isn't it great to you know when, when you know that somebody is doing good in hard times? Doesn't it bring joy to us even today? But we also wonder, how come I'm going through the hard times? But there was joy that was brought to him, even though those trials. Let's go to uh, let's go to Second Corinthians chapter one. Now this one I'll have to be be reined in because I just want to go to a verse, and later on I'll go to the end of the chapter, which means I should probably do the beginning and the end and everything <laughs> in the middle. <laughs> 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And I like how, how simple the Bible can be. The Corinthians is addressed to who? The Corinthians. <laughs> but it's application as it being a church epistle for us. It says, in verse number 1 it says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, with all the saints which are in all Achaia. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all. Come up. I almost said combat, but comfort. <laughs> the God of all comfort, who comfort us, us in all our tribulation. Paul can say that, that God comforted them through all their tribulation, through stonings, through being, being, being thrown out of cities, through being, being brought to death by the stonings, all these things, who comfort us all in, in all our tribulation that we may be able to comfort them which are any trouble. So any kind of tribulation you have in this world, when you realize the comfort that you have from God, it allows you to comfort those who are in any tribulation whatsoever. We understand, I, unfortunately, the, or fortunately, the school of hard knocks, actually the tuition is, is a lot, costs an arm and a leg, literally, sometimes. But yet, the fruit that comes out of that 
is amazing. And I, I hate this term, is been there, done that, I bought the t-shirt. But when you go through trials and tribulations, and God is the one that comforts you, you can say to others, I know what it's like. I know what you're going through. I know how to comfort those that go through any other, any situation at all. And where does that come from? That comes from God. That comes from the Holy Spirit, not just a force, but the person of the Holy Spirit leads us into truth of the Scripture. The Scripture, not, not anything else. The Scripture which comforts us. Who comforted us in all our tribulation that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. In verses 3 and 4, I could go on further here, but verses 3 and 4, the word comfort is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 times in, in just those two verses. You think God wants us to be comforted? Amen. In all our trials, He is the one that comforts us. The Holy Spirit is the comforter. Yes, the Holy Spirit is God, and God is God, and Jesus Christ is God. So we get to know them, it brings us comfort. I go further because it, the rest of the chapter is great. I love, uh, I, I prefer just to go through all of 2 Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians in one sitting. The God of all comfort, that's the theme of that entire book. But let's go over to Galatians for a second. Book of Galatians. Again, chapter number one. I just want to stop me at, at verse five. <laughs> verse six, we could go into a whole whole other thing here. Verse number one says, Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia. Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. There should be a reason to rejoice right there. Delivered, uh, might deliver us from the present evil world according to God the Father, God our Father. Through the trials and tribulations, guess what's waiting? Deliverance. We'll see later in, in, uh, in, in 1 Thessalonians that God has not not given us up to wrath. We will not go through wrath, but be delivered from the wrath to come. Right? I like the ultimate deliverance there is up and out. We said, I had a boss at work, he always used to say that about what we call pitching mail, called pitching it up. And they get out the door. He'd walk around and say, up and out, up and out. I say that at all time in work now, but I don't mean up with the mail and out with the mail. I mean up and out of here with the Lord, when that archangel, when that archangel calls. Let's go back to 1 Thessalonians 3. Verse number seven still, therefore, brethren, we are comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith. Think of even today our influence on people when they see how you handle stress. 
Are things stressful? Yes. Are they distressful? Yes. Are there times you want to get out of the car and on the way to church this morning, I want to knock a car off the side of the road. <laughs> it's going so slow and I'm a slow driver, so that's something. <laughs> Therefore, brethren, we, are, we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith. Here in the Apostle Paul, talking about their distress and tribulation and hearing the news back from Timothy that these in Thessalonica, they remember what they heard. They remember the gospel. They remember your teachings. They remember that they belong to God and not the prince of this world. They remember those things. Verse number 8 says, For now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. I said, what? Was Paul going to, you know, bump himself off or something? He says, now we live. We can, we can do this. <sighs> a great exhale. You know what happens when you don't exhale enough? You end up you know, choking and not being able to breathe. Now we can live. We can have this assurance. We can have this comfort that, that they're doing okay. That they're going through their own trials and their circumstances in the right manner. And I'm convinced, even with all the hardships that the Apostle Paul and others had, that they still enjoyed their lives. At times, much times, stressful and injurious, but oh, to hear this word about the Thessalonians brought along such more life into them. Doesn't good news from afar breathe life into you? And we, and just practically speaking, we go through life, the humdrums of life. I've worked 60 hours this week. I'm tired. I'm frail. But we hear and see others that are standing firm in the faith, no matter what the circumstances, it breathes life into us. Not that we don't have true life. We have life. The life we have is the life of Christ. We have the mind of Christ. That's why we can also make great decisions. Conversely, we can all think of people, sadly, who call themselves Christian, who have denounced God, said they don't believe in God, they've rejected the church, they've rejected everything. It's a heartbreaking thing. That sex, the life, that same life where somebody that stands in trials, somebody that says, I, I don't believe in God. God doesn't exist. We've all heard it, haven't we? We all know people that, have, that, that that's happened to. See, the Bible's not true. Public education will push all that stuff. The Bible's not true. It's a bunch of myths that man wrote. All these different things. And when you hear somebody that, that's been anchored in the faith, in the truth of God's word to believe that God doesn't exist now, truly does this. I can't believe they could believe that. But yet it happens. So what we hear of those who, no matter what, have, have gone through life or get through life, with their, with their head held up, not, not in a high-minded thing, but with their head, head held up because of what the Lord has done. It's reassuring. Let's go to verse number 9. For what thanks can we render to God again for you, for all the joy wherewith we joy for your sakes before our God? You can't thank God enough. What more can we add 
to our thanksgiving unto God, except for the joy that we joy for your sakes before our God. You ever told God, I have joy for so and so? Such and such person gives me joy. And that only works if it's God himself that gives you joy. I like the, uh, the old expression that joy is an acronym for Jesus, others, and you. Who's last on the totem pole? The you. You is. <laughs> and remember, those that, that preach the gospel, those that teach, they don't, they're not to lord over people, telling people what they must do, but they are, according to 2 Corinthians 1.24, which we won't go to because I'll start in verse number 1 again, that we are not lording over your faith, but helpers in your joy. We should have joy through the gospel. That's what we're here for. We're not here to get all the, I almost said eyes crossed and T's dotted, the eyes dotted and the T's crossed. We're here, all of us, to be helpers of one another's joy. Amen? To lift each other up. Right? Because it's easy to get down. And we can't do it in a, in a hard way. Well, you know that Jesus died for you. No, in loving kindness that we have everything that we need in life through Jesus Christ. Right? Had these, ran across these verses on Wednesday in, in uh, Psalm 5, verses 11 and 12. But, is that word again, if we were to go there, we'd see David praying about the, that God would get back at, it, at, the, at, at his enemies. <laughs> It says, but let all those that, that put their trust in thee rejoice. Let them ever shout for joy. Woohoo! I do that when a, when a Patriots score a touchdown. Yeah! Watch a football stadium after a touchdown. The whole place goes bananas. Right? I was at a baseball game the other night when there's a home run hit. Wow! The whole place goes, goes crazy. Right? Unfortunately, the Red Sox didn't hit any home runs, so that didn't happen. <laughs> but yet, when we understand the nature of God and his love, and the faith that, that, that we have in him, the more it ought to produce joy. That same kind of joy in the football stadium. God has, hit a, God has won the Super Bowl for us. Amen? What a metaphor that is. But, <laughs> right? We don't have to worry about, oh, the greatest of all time went to 10 Super Bowls and won seven. That means he, he lost three. God's never lost. Amen? And you have all these benefits that have been given. All these benefits that have been, that have been predestined to us. As soon as you're saved, you're predestined to have a new body. You're predestined to sit in heavenly places, of which we already see. All these things happen to a believer. Amen? I can't wait for those things. That's why I can joy in God. That's why we can have joy today rather than sorrow, knowing that we're not of this world. We're of Christ. We're of God, and he's taken us out of here. This is going to be a good setup for chapter 4. So we have this joy that's, that's unspeakable in the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, let me finish. Uh, I never finished Psalm 5, 11, and 12. But I stopped at shouting there. Didn't I? <laughs> but let all those that put their trust in thee rejoice. Let them ever shout for joy because thou defendest them. Let them also that love thy name be joyful in thee. 
Not joyful in the circumstances, but joyful in the God who's over the circumstances. For thou, Lord, wilt bless the righteous with favor, wilt thou compass him as with a shield. We don't have to look at the in, in Ephesians 6 at the, at the full armor of God. He's given all that for protection, offensively and defensively. We have one package, and that is the Lord himself. God himself is our protector and our provider. Verse number uh, 10. Night and day praying exceedingly that we might see your face. Don't you just want to see other people that were joyful? It's why you long to see them. Not just to hear the secondhand news that, that Timothy had brought. He wanted to see them. I think I'm thinking of that song right now. Oh, I want to see him look upon his face. Na, 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 na. <laughs> of the saving grace. I'll remember that. One day, we don't have to worry about seeing Paul or anybody else. One day, we'll see Jesus. We don't know what, he, what he's like right now, but we know that we'll be like him, right, when, when, when we see him. Night and day, praying exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. I said, hmm, I thought we had all things that pertain to life and godly. I thought we were perfect already. We're, perfect, we're, we're positionally perfect. We've been, we, we have everything we need. So what are you going to be saying? I, I, I think it's interesting, you know, yes, indeed, the believer has, has grace that's front-loaded to him. He said that we have all the grace we ever need. Right? We, there's no way that we earn grace. There's no, no way that... Uh, that any kind of observation would give us more grace. We have it all. We have all the grace we need. Right? Think of that. That grace overflows. That grace bubbles up, but yet, what do we do with that grace? Paul says here, he says, that we might and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. That's why we're here together. Good place to go would be Ephesians 4. You know, we we'll come together in, in, in unity, in, in, in the Lord Jesus Christ to learn and grow. Because what are we? We're bags of bones. We're flesh. Our faith wavers. Waking up yesterday morning, creaking bones and all. I wasn't thinking firsthand about the Lord. You know, I was thinking about how aching I was. But to perfect, to perfect their faith, what does that mean? Perfect in, uh, actually means, that the, there's different words for, for this and, and throughout the Bible, but the word here is, is to repair or adjust, right? It's like the Corinthians who missed out on a lot on what they were supposed to be doing. The Thessalonians were lacking, why? I simply make it easy. They're humans. They have human human ideas, human inventions. They all have their own ideas. So Paul, let, let's 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 perfect. Let's let's adjust what's going on and repair what's going on. If you don't have faith in you, your faith is in the Lord. All these things. These are everybody has different things, right? And lacking. Literally, is a deficit. Literally, a deficit. Uh, the word lacking. So the things lack that we perfect those things which are lacking. It's a deficit. All of humanity has a deficit. Right? Christians aren't saved because they they have gotten everything right and no longer have a deficit. I think there's some that would lead lead you to that way. Do seven seven messages on how to have a better relationship, it's act, and all these different things. 
but yet we're complete in Christ. But yet, humanly speaking, we do have deficits, don't we? Anybody get mad at their husband or wife in the last <laughs> two uh, days, weeks, hours. weeks, minutes, hours? <laughs> <laughs> Our humanity. Get to a point where when you know that you started out with puppy love because everything turns into a dog fight, right? <laughs> Amen. That, that's how we that's that's how humanity lacks because we're human. And so what we do more and more, let's let's close and let's go to first Corinthians, uh, I mean Colossians chapter three. Yes, it's the ever ever popular unplanned ending. <coughs> and oh, this sounds so simple, but we're when we're dealing with the flesh, when we're dealing with the old man wanting to wanting to come out and be nourished, it's difficult. Colossians three. If ye then be risen with Christ, right? no longer the dead person, no longer the old man, you're risen with Christ. Seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. That's the key right there. That is the impossible key for humanity, because as long as we're in the in the flesh here, our flesh is going to ask for priority. If I had a microphone on my stomach, you could hear the growling. Right? We have these these things, that human things, that that cause us not to seek those things of life. Verse number three. For ye are dead. Remember Romans chapter 6, verse 3, the old man is D-E-A-D, -E dead. Right? He's been crucified with Christ. <clears throat> For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ, where? In God. Isn't that the song we have at the end? Hiding in thee. It's a great song. Hiding in thee. We're dead. Our life is hidden in God, with Christ. Verse number four. When Christ, who is our life. I like that. People that don't recognize Jesus Christ as God. John chapter six. For I am the way, the truth, and the life. Mortify your God. Uh, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. For which I say, glory. Amen? That's how, you know, you can take, you can read a hundred books about how to, how to have a better life. You can read books about finances, relationships, how to, how to pray down devils. You sound like I'm, sound like I'm from the south here. I'm like, you can try that. Pray down devils and cast demons out of people. But no, the answer is right here. That's how you mortify the flesh. If you don't mortify, that's the next verse. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil, compuscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. Going back to remembering. Verse number seven. In the which ye also walked. Sometime when you lived in them. Amen. We're all there. We were, we were all outside of Christ and, and did those same exact things. I didn't do it as bad as my next door neighbor, though. Well, he still did it <laughs> for some time, right? The answer, how do you mortify those members? Verse number one, if you'd be... Then risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. 
the greatest thing that can ever happen in answer to sin, suffering, no matter what, add another S if you want, is the gospel. Plain and simple. That's the good news. Imagine if the news, instead of the same old story over and over and over again about the bleakness of life, gave one story over and over again that Jesus Christ is Lord and he's coming. They couldn't do that. That doesn't sell. Bad news sells. And we get taken in by the bad news. It's like a magnet. Admit it. The only reason to go to a car race is to watch the crash, right? Right? The only reason to go to a hockey game, I hate the fact they get rid of fighting. Why else would you go to a hockey game? You want the fight to happen. That's what, that's what human beings love. They love death. But give life. The gospel gives life. It takes our mortal, dead, mortal bodies, and we have life. Faith does not lack, but our faith can lack when it's placed on the wrong thing. It's the you get to's rather than the you got to's. We get to fellowship together. We don't got to. You can do anything you want. You make the right choices. Amen? The choices we make you know, are all up to, up to us. Say, yeah, the devil made me do it. Well, you could say, God, it's God, he who is in you is greater than he that's in the world. Wouldn't he that's in you sway you better than the person that's of the world? Amen. So look above. Look to the gospel of our salvation. That's the only way we're going to have, have any remedy against sin and suffering. If we look to ourselves, nothing but bad news there. Amen? Trust the Lord. Simple, but difficult at the same time. Amen? I have no other thing to add.